Hello, and welcome to our virtual iHeart Science Festival. Thank you to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Javier, and I'm a museum educator at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, and I will be your host for today's live events. Sophie Barton is a graduate student in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. Today, she'll be sharing her presentation titled, Why is my dog like that? Let's welcome Sophie. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here with you today. And the first thing that I would like to show you is actually this skull. So I'm gonna hold it up close to the camera and kind of as I tilt it around, I want you to think to yourself what sort of animal this skull might belong to. So just make your best educated guess as you have a look at this skull. Okay, I hope everybody has their guesses. I am now going to show you the answer. So, the answer is an English bulldog. So if you guessed dog, you were correct. Um, and this is a breed of dog called um, an English bulldog that has this sort of underbite um, that you can see here in the skull where the lower jaw kind of pops out further than the upper jaw as you can see in the skull and then also in the picture. And the dog has a fairly short snout. Now I'm going to show you a different skull. So here we go. Now this one obviously looks quite different from the last one. Um, but again, I would like you to think to yourself what sort of animal this skull might belong to as I turn it around. Here we go. Make an educated guess to yourself. Okay, let's see. So I am going to share the picture with you. So it's not this one, but it is this, um, the Irish Wolfhound. So this is also another breed of dog um, that of course looks quite different. Um, so this breed of dog is actually the tallest breed of dog um, on earth. And so that's why the skull is quite a bit larger than the last dog you saw. And you might notice that the snout um, is a, quite a bit larger as well. And the back of the skull is less rounded and is more elongated. So I will show you it very briefly again. And you can see it's very similar to the picture in terms of the snout. Okay, now I'm gonna show you one last skull. So bear with me for a moment. And here we go. So once again, I want you to guess what sort of animal this might be to yourself. So just think to yourself, what sort of animal? Hold it up a bit closer while everyone makes their educated guesses to themselves. Okay, now I will tell you the answer. So this skull is actually a wolf skull, so not a dog skull, um, but the wolf is of course a very close relative to the domestic dog. And you might think that it kind of looks like the skull that we just saw, um, but it's actually a bit smaller, um, but it has that same long snout and elongated back part of the skull. And then you might not have been able to tell, but if you look very closely, um, the teeth on the wolf skull are quite big and proportionally they're bigger um, than the dog skulls that you saw previously. Um, so the wolf has bigger teeth, even though it kind of looks um, quite similar. So now I would like to kind of talk about why these dogs um, and you know the wolves are look different from one another. So I think it's very interesting that they come in these different shapes and sizes. And to understand why they look how they look and how they behave how they behave, you need to understand something about their evolution or how they've changed over time. So 
I think it's really interesting to think about how dogs evolve to become different from wolves since they're quite closely related, um, but also how dog breeds evolved to look different from one another. So they have very different shapes and sizes like the Irish wolfhound pictured here and the English bulldog um, pictured here. So to better understand this, um, you have to look at their evolutionary history. So we know that in the past, there was probably this ancient wolf population that lived roughly 30,000 years ago, um, which then um, diverged into two different um, kind of lineages or lines. So one became domestic dogs, and then the other one became the gray wolf. But how exactly did this happen? Well, we think that ancient wolves lived in packs and hunted large animals, just like modern wolves do today. So they were hunting animals like deer. But hunting deer can be kind of difficult and most uh, wolf hunts actually aren't successful. So sometimes wolves would go hungry for long periods of time. Now, those hungry wolves, if they were brave enough, um, could approach human settlements. And just like humans today, um, humans would leave out um, garbage or um, scraps or leftovers from carcasses or things that they were working on. And the wolves could take advantage of that free resource um, to eat um, and survive through periods of hunger. Um, so long as that they were brave enough to be near humans because of course humans are dangerous since humans can have weapons and humans might not like it if wolves are nearby. So um, at first it might've been kind of dangerous for the wolves. But over time, um, some of those brave wolves um, survived better than the other wolves because they were able to tolerate living near people and they had this really great food source um, that was very reliable and was easy to obtain. So those wolves um, stuck around in the human environment and over time they became what's called village dogs um, through self-domestication. And self-domestication is a type of evolution that occurs usually when an animal um, becomes more comfortable around um, another species, usually people, um, and they start to live um, in a very similar environment or the same environment as that person. Um, or that, that species. So wolves um, eventually became these village dogs that were perfectly suited and adapted to living with people and eating scraps. And actually it turns out that most dogs in the world are village dogs. Um, so I think the statistics now is 80% of dogs in the world um, live in this niche like their ancestors did, where they will um, eat scraps and they don't really have owners. They kind of move freely around. Sometimes people might feed them. Sometimes people might chase them away. So they have a very dynamic relationship with people. And of course, um, something to note is that they look different from wolves. Um, and one reason for this is they don't need to be as large because they aren't hunting anymore. Um, but also you might notice that they look cuter than wolves. Um, and this is because dogs that um, were attractive to people and weren't as scary um, could get closer to people and get all the best scraps. And so over time they've become um, more friendly looking and also friendly behaving towards people. But you might be wondering what happened to the wolves who were too afraid to um, go live with humans? Well, they actually became modern day gray wolves and they stayed in the wild. So modern wolves are super elusive. It's very rare for people to see them um, just because they try to stay as far away from people as possible. Um, and then they still hunt um, large game like deer, uh, just like their ancestors used to. But dogs also went through a second stage of evolution. Um, so very recently, only 150 years ago, roughly during the Victorian period um, in the UK, as well as in Europe, humans began to selectively breed dogs to create new looks and behavior. So people decided that they would like to have dogs live on their property and in their homes and have special traits. So they could be good companions or they could win dog shows for them or they could do jobs for them. Uh, for instance, like herding sheep or um, sniffing out 
uh, bad guys. So this is um, a process called artificial selection. It's a type of evolution, and it happens when people deliberately try to um, encourage traits um, in another animal. So trying to get either a really big dog in this case of the Great Dane, or maybe a long body in the case of the Basset Hound, for example. And it kind of works a bit like this. So let's say that there is a person who really likes these eyebrow markings on dogs. They think it's really cute. So what they would do is take a dog that has the eyebrow markings that they like. They would breed them with another dog so that those two dogs have puppies. And then they would select the puppies that have the eyebrow marking trait and then only let those puppies grow up to have more puppies um, when, once they're adults. And then the rest of these puppies here would probably be given away to pet homes um, where they end up not having puppies and they don't reproduce. So over time in this particular dog breed shown here, um, more and more dogs might have this eyebrow marking and it might become more standard for um, the breed. And if you do this for multiple traits, um, you can get different dog breeds. And that's why there are so many different dog breeds on the planet today. And of course, the process I just mentioned, artificial selection, has created many new looks and behaviors in dogs, like being bigger than a wolf in the case of my Irish wolfhound Finn, or having these really cute floppy ears, um, like my Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Parker, or also um, doing cool behaviors like herding sheep. So border collies um, use their eyes and their body movements to move sheep around to different pastures to help farmers take care of sheep. So now we're going to uh, take a brief poll. I want to know how has artificial selection shaped your dog or a friend's dog if you don't have one? Um, so there are a couple of answers here, um, including short snout, blue eyes, very friendly or very easy to train. If you don't see a trait here that matches with a dog you know, you can say other. Um, and if your dog has multiple of these traits, you can just pick the one that you like best. And by the way, in this bottom corner is another one of my dogs named Tamsin. Um, this picture is from when she graduated puppy obedience, and I can tell you that she's definitely not easy to train, so she wouldn't fall under this category, but she is very friendly. And let's see, okay, so quite a lot of people have dogs that are very friendly. Um, and this is something that many modern pet dogs are today because it lets them live in our homes and close quarters um, much more easily and it helps them get along with um, other people and other dogs because we all live in this cramped environment. For most people, we live in suburbs or cities where there are lots of people. Um, I see there's also a short snout, um, blue eyes. Some people said that, but very few. Um, and some people also said easy to train. And then there is also a fair number of people who said other. Um, so going through those, uh, short snout is something that um, people have selected for more recently because village dogs uh, naturally all tend to have kind of a mid-sized snout, um, but people selected the short snout because it either helped the dog do its job or it looked cute. Blue eyes are another thing that um, you don't ever see in wolves, but blue eyes emerged in dogs and they've become part of the breed standard for some dogs. So Siberian Huskies oftentimes have blue eyes. And then easy to train is something else um, that some dogs have and others don't have. So um, dogs actually vary according to how trainable they are, um, how willing they are to work with people. And it turns out that dogs who historically used to do jobs that um, involved working closely with people, like a herding dog herding sheep, are today easier to train, even if they don't really do that job anymore. So... Next, um, I would like to kind of talk more about my research in particular. So I study how artificial selection, like we just discussed, has changed how dogs look and behave on the outside, as well as look and think on the inside. So to look at how they physically look and to see how they behave towards different aspects of the world, I ask people to bring their dogs to my lab, pictured here, and then we do fun 
and kind of quirky behavioral tests with them to get an idea of how they respond to different things. So here we have a dog um, who is undergoing the bumble ball test. So it's this weird ball that bounces around on the ground. It makes a lot of noise. It's kind of scary. Um, and we see how um, brave dogs are towards a new scary object. Um, but also I study how dogs link, uh, look and think on the inside. So basically their brains um, that produces their behavior. So um, here is a 3D model of a dog brain. And all of my research typically involves looking at pictures and models of dog brains on my computer, just like this one. And one of my major questions is, has selection for behavior change the brains of different dog breeds? Now, to answer this question, I um, put dogs in a machine called an MRI scanner. So while the dog is taking a nap, um, I put them inside this um, magnet here. So this big donut thing is a magnet um, that works a lot like an x-ray. So it lets you see inside the dog's brain um, and inside their head without harming the dog. Um, so it's completely safe. And you actually might have had an MRI yourself if you've ever had an injury. Um, and the cool thing is it produces pictures not unlike these. And using these pictures and some fancy math, you can figure out um, different volumes of different parts of the brain. You can figure out how the brain is wired and a bunch of cool things. So one thing that I do is look at different structures like here, the olfactory bulb, which is this thing at the end of the brain, which basically helps the dog understand what it is smelling with its nose in the environment. And I look to see in different dog breeds like the Border Collie versus the German Shorthair Pointer, who are selected to do jobs that involve the sensor of smell more or less, um, how that has shaped their olfactory bulb. So Border Collies do most of their herding using their sense of sight, um, whereas German Shorthair Pointers do most of their hunting um, using their sense of smell. So they're finding hidden birds in bushes and trees and grass. And I basically use fancy maths, like I mentioned, to figure out what differences um, there are between breeds. But it turns out that selection for skull shape can also change the brains of different dog breeds because the brain is housed inside the skull. And for this, I look at dog breeds who um, do the same historical function. For instance, the Doberman and the Boxer both were guarding and fighting dogs um, in the past. They're also police dogs, so they're doing a lot of those protective functions, um, but they have very different faces. So the Boxer has this very short and wide head, and then the Doberman has this very long head, which you can see here. And basically, I do the same thing where I compare the um, a structure in the brain like the olfactory bulb to see how it has changed because of skull shape. But you don't actually need fancy maths or an MRI machine or, or even a laboratory to be a dog scientist. You can actually be a dog scientist too. So because of the pandemic, we can't bring dogs to the lab. Um, so we need your help to be an experimenter in your own home to run an experiment for us to see how dogs play with toys and solve puzzles. And to do this, all you really need is a cell phone um, pictured here to film short clips of your dog and then one of your dog's regular toys and then either a cup with a piece of paper that goes over it or a tennis ball you don't mind cutting up to put treats inside. Um, and then you just film videos of those and submit them to us. And if you're interested in doing this, um, the website is caninebrains.org slash pawgames. And of course, if you're younger than 18, you will need parental permission and help to do this study. Um, but we would really love it if um, someone um, who's interested in this sort of thing would follow um, this link and participate because we need your help um, doing this experiment. So here are my picture credits. And now I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about dogs or dog evolution. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you so much, Sophie. Really appreciate it. So why don't we go ahead and answer some questions? Uh, the first question I have for you from an attendee is, is the ancient wolf that you mentioned a dire wolf? No, um, actually the dire wolf, um, according to um, some recent studies, uh, is not um, the same a uh, wolf that dogs and modern wolves came from. It's kind of a different branch on the evolutionary tree. Um, and dire wolves actually might have lived in a bit of a different niche or environment to um, gray wolves and those ancient um, wolves that produced gray wolves and domestic dogs. So those animals were a bit bigger, they had a bit bigger jaws, and they might have been scavengers that basically chased away um, other hunters from prey that they just killed. So kind of like a hyena in the modern day. So they're a bit different. Interesting. Uh, well, to that effect, you mentioned that wolves and dogs descended from a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. it how similar or different are the wolves today to that common ancestor? Are they pretty much the same? Uh, so scientists are still studying this and we don't exactly know, um, but we think that they probably had very similar um, skeleton structures. So from the ancient fossils that we have from them, we know that they probably had um, skulls that were not completely unlike this. And usually in biology, if dogs or, you know, if different animals have similar sorts of adaptations, like similar sized snouts and teeth and things like this, then you can kind of infer that they were doing um, a similar function in their environment. Like, um, you know, an animal like this is a predator because it has big teeth and it's probably hunting big prey. Um, so that's the best that we really know about these wolves, um, but we're um, still studying it. And the cool thing is you can do this by studying the DNA of different dogs and wolves across the world to kind of narrow down um, the ancestral traits. Um, and then you can also look at old fossils. Interesting. Well, we've got a lot of great questions. Someone is wondering about uh, dog headaches, right? specifically Doberman headaches, and whether or not boxers also get the same kind of headaches. Uh, so headaches is in um, like you have when you have a sore head. Yeah, I'm not sure if the question specifies that Doberman specifically have headaches, but uh, the question says, can you talk about Doberman headaches in particular and do boxers also have those headaches? I wonder if it's because of the skull shape. Yeah, so some dog breeds because of their skull shape um, have neurological issues because the brain is basically too um, big for the skull. Um, so this often happens in short-faced dogs like the boxer, um, but it can also happen in dog breeds with really long faces because their heads can get very narrow and it kind of squeezes the skull this way. Um, so to my knowledge, um, one breed that really has this issue where they might get headaches or they may even get seizures is the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So my dog Parker that I showed on that slide that was um, red with the fluffy ears. Um, since they have this very round and small skull, sometimes their brain is just pushing against the skull and that can cause um, pain and seizures and other bad things. Um, so that's something that people who breed those kinds of dogs are trying to um, keep in mind. And maybe they're trying to breed a bit bigger skulls and heads so dogs don't have that issue. But it's definitely something that can happen because of skull shape. Oh, poor pups. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, how long have you been studying dogs and their behavior? And can you share any unusual experiments that you have not mentioned yet? Yeah, I can. Um, so I am a second year graduate student, but I have been studying dogs for probably uh, three or four years now because I also studied them while I was in uh, college studying for my undergraduate degree. Um, and in our lab, we actually do a couple of different um, cool experiments other than the bumble ball test. Um, so we do one where we test whether the dog um, seems to have an empathetic response to a person who's in pain. So to do this, we have an experimenter kneel on the ground and pretend that they're hammering something on the ground. And they'll do it around their hand and then suddenly pretend to hit 
their um, thumb and then they do some really good acting and they kind of rock back and forth and say, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, like this. And we're filming, um, of course, in the laboratory and we see the dog's response and we get a lot of variations. So some dogs become seemingly very concerned and they run up to the person and they lick them and they try to see what's going on and then there are other dogs who just don't care at all and continue to sniff around the room and they don't mind that someone seems to be in pain um so that's another thing that we study in the lab interesting uh so juliet wants to know why do dogs love toys that's a great question um and the answer is basically toys engage a dog's prey drive. So even though dogs don't really have to hunt anymore now that they live in our homes, um, many dog breeds still have the ancestral trait of wanting to chase items, wanting to shake them, and wanting to tear them up. So all of those behaviors are actually part of the um, dog hunting motor sequence. So naturally, when wolves are hunting, they will first find prey, they'll orient, then they will stalk the prey, they will chase, they will bite, kill, and then they dissect the prey, which is eating the prey. Um, so basically, if your dog tears up toys, your dog is dissecting the toy as if it were an animal carcass, which is um, kind of morbid when you think about it, but it's just part of the dog's natural behavior. Interesting. So we've got time for a few more questions, and we've got so many great questions. We apologize we can't get to everybody. Uh, but Cheryl wants to know, how did some dogs become hypoallergenic, and which breeds are the most hypoallergenic? Yeah, so um, basically dogs who are hypoallergenic have coat types that don't let their skin dander fall to the ground as easily. So that's what you're actually allergic to, which is the dander on the dog. Um, and so people kind of um, noticed that poodles happen to um, not cause as extreme allergic reactions in people who are allergic to different um, dog breeds. And so they started to breed them with other dog breeds to create like a golden doodle or a labradoodle. And those dogs tend to be a bit um, easier for people who have allergies to be around. Um, so basically people figured that out through trial and error. Interesting. Uh, we've got another question and it says, is much more variation in dog evolution still possible today? Yeah, so um, dog evolution is still happening um, in the modern day. Um, a big thing that is happening now is, you know, during the Victorian era, there were dogs who were bred for hunting or herding or guarding and all these sorts of behaviors. But in the modern day, when we live in really small apartments and we need the dogs to get along with everyone and be more friendly, um, we're seeing this transition in many breeds where they no longer have the qualities that their ancestors used to have. So for instance, my Irish wolfhound, um, was bred historically to hunt wolves, but he doesn't actually have a prey drive. Um, I've never seen him chase anything. Um, and that's because it was kind of bred out of his line because it made him easier to live with. So dogs are still evolving in that way. Interesting. So we've got time for one more question, I think. Uh, a question I have, we have here is, are there any other animals that self-domesticate? And if so, why or why not? Yes, um, there are. Cats are a really great example. So cats started to live near human settlements once we became more sedentary because rodents love to live around people. Um, so cats are self-domesticated. Um, and then also currently we're in the very early stages of some urban animals becoming self-domesticated. So raccoons and foxes and squirrels that feed off of human garbage are becoming um, more tolerant of people and more um, friendly towards people and less aggressive towards people. Um, and that's because it lets them eat um, garbage uh, more easily. So yeah, foxes one day might actually be um, domesticated, not unlike dogs. Amazing. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the fantastic questions. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you.